nuclear stockpiles everywhere on on Earth. And so, along with a documentary uh, called "If You Love This Planet." Um, yeah. Uh, and a couple of movies uh, like uh, Treads or The Day After. Uh, 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 so these The Day things, After. Yeah. That was the movie that was made in 1985 or maybe 84, earlier. 84, 85-ish. It was like the first movie of like what would it be like if nuclear war... And like it was really yeah. grim, and it was the first time anybody had seen that, and everybody freaked out. And um, you know what's really weird about that is I'm totally cutting you off, so I'm sorry. But what's really weird about that is back then, and this is a hard thing to convey to people now, but people grew up seriously worried about the war, the war, the uh, planet being destroyed in a nuclear war. Yeah, every second of the day. And like nobody thinks that anymore, which is really weird because it could still happen. And it's just hard to convey to people. If you grew up in that era, there was the Cold War and all this stuff, and you really thought that any second somebody was going to go boop. Totally, totally. And uh, um, I mean, you know, in the, uh, it really, really uh, started to worry me. Uh, and uh, um, in the uh, in the early eighties, and then. Uh, by the time we did War and Pain, uh, we were uh, full on into the scare of the Cold War uh, nuclear disaster and all that. And so uh, that's what I tried to represent on the cover of the very first album, War and Pain. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, and by the, uh, I was always afraid of high-tech weaponry, but by the time we hit, the, let's say, the mid-90s, um, I was uh, talking about uh, uh, nuclear uh, war in uh, interviews and people were telling me that I was retro, uh, but the weapons were all, the weapons were always, the, the bombs were always there and there's, and there still are, you know? Yeah, so, but people, yeah. but people don't really think about that anymore. Like, oh, you're, right. you're worrying about, ret you're worrying about nuclear war is so retro. You should worry about this instead. Yeah. This is but I mean, uh, in the last couple of years, it has, uh, it got back to the front uh, line uh, a little more, um, you know, uh, with North Korea and uh, Iran. And so uh, it's still, uh, it's getting back into the headlines, but uh, back in the, uh, let's say between 1980 and 85, uh, it was a real uh, worry for uh, our generation. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that, well, that's like, well, you're from my generation, so you, you, you remember. I mean, that's what all the kids I knew that were sort of into the same things that I was into, that, that's what they were preoccupied with, that any second yeah. somebody was going to, you know. And then, like, um, I think around the same time, I remember buying the, the Discharge album, Hear Nothing, See Nothing, Say Nothing. And again, it's kind of hard to convey to people because, like, remember when you bought the first Venom record, and if you were a nerd like me, you were actually scared of that record, the way it sounded and what it represented. Yeah. Like, oh, these guys really believe in Satan. I took it at face value that they were serious. <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta start somewhere, you know? So when I bought the Discharge album, I was like, just the whole sound of it, the 8,000 guitar tracks and that mm -hmm. distorted bass, it just, it was like, a song after song of just terror and horror. And that record scared the crap out of me for like about a week. And then I got used to it. But it just, <laughs> that record echoed what a lot of kids thought. They just thought any yeah. second. <sighs> now they yeah. worry about other stuff. Uh, the, uh, the, yeah, Discharge and Venom were a revolution for sure. I mean, just uh, maybe a year or two uh, before that, we, um, we had Aaron Maiden and Judas Priest and all that. But, um, um, all, of, all of a sudden it got really heavy and that's uh, within uh, not even two years, like a year and a half maybe. And I, I think so know, because yeah. Unleashed in the East came out in 1979 when I bought it when it came out. That was my first Judas Priest album. Mm -hmm. That record just blew me away. Just totally blew me away. And uh, there are some really dramatic songs on that record that almost predate 
some of what came later, like that song, Genocide. It's really dramatic sounding and the lyrics are warmongering and whatever. And then a couple of years went by and, um, no, one year went by and then the first Iron Maiden record came out. But that was, that was a great record, but that was a small, that, that was a little less scary, but it was still a great record. And then Venom came out and it was like, okay, this is, this is terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I took it at face value, you know. I just thought, man, these these guys are evil, you know. <laughs> it, it definitely, it definitely sounded evil. Uh, uh, and to me, they were the new Black Sabbath. They had a real horror uh, vibe to uh, to their music, and uh, they they have really influenced Voivod. And uh, we, uh, uh, Piggy was a huge fan of Mantis, and uh, so uh, they they had a, a very strong impact uh, on the band. Oh yeah. Yeah, because they were kind of like taking sort of what Motorhead did and made it more up the ante, sort of, I guess, but more evil, for lack of better, for lack of better words. <laughs> and, you know, again, it's just hard to convey how revolutionary that was at the time. Now nobody cares because, you know, Venom's pretty cheesy compared to, you know, people that burn churches in other countries and are willing to kill people to prove how metal they are. But um, at the time, it was really shocking stuff, really scary stuff. That's now right. it's like, yeah, but now it's like nobody cares. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I just had to ask you about that stuff because I just noticed you uh, always are wearing a conflict shirt or a crash shirt. And uh, I was like, I know you guys like, you know, a lot of English stuff, you know, from the yeah. festivals to the. Uh, especially uh, Snake, Snake and I especially really got into Exploited, Discharge, and uh, also uh, uh, the, uh, American Hardcore as well. So, uh, uh, What kind of American Hardcore did you guys like? Well, I, I um, myself was really into DRI, COC, uh, Snake as well, and uh, um, I, I liked Minor Threat and all that, but I was never a straight edge, so I uh, didn't... Uh, <laughs> I, I like the music, uh, I like the uh, uh, the message and all that, but uh, uh, I, I uh, pretty much uh, uh, focused on, um, let's say, um, uh, the Misfits and uh, COC and DRI and uh, NDC. Uh, there was uh, the Accused. Yeah, the Accused was a favorite of mine. So yeah, uh, the, yeah. There, 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 there is a lot of good... Uh, American hardcore uh, out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Were you ever were you ever a fan of Black Flag? Yeah, I um, you know, um, I I was uh, not really uh, paying um, as much attention as um, some of my friends were, uh, but I I liked uh, the sort of uh, it's like COC. I like when they were doing slower riff. Uh, before jumping into something a little more, uh, a little faster, uh, there, there, there was a Black Sabbath heaviness to it that uh, I really appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. So by CRC, you mean the Animosity record, the three piece? Yes, yes. I uh, love that album. And uh, Technocracy, is that the other one? Yeah. yeah. And uh, there was a, an eye for an eye, maybe, or. Uh... That was the first one. That was yeah. The first one. Uh, and uh, this, this. Um, I mean, the, the crossover uh, um, happened a little after in the mid 80s, but um, uh, slowly but surely, a lot of uh, hardcore people were listening to uh, Metallica and, and uh, Celtic Frost and, and, and then, uh, um, and then the, the metal people were listening to hardcore a little more. And by the mid 80s, we were doing shows with uh, Agnostic Front and uh, everybody. So. Um, uh, it, and, uh, and the first time we played in uh, uh, England was with uh, uh, the English Dogs, um, also with Possessed, but are just insane. So uh, yeah, so eventually, uh, eventually, like uh, it really blended together for uh, um, for better or worse. But for to me, it was a, a just a great, uh, just the the crossover between the hardcore and metal was something great to me. Yeah, cool. Well, I was just curious. So, so this, so this pandemic stuff is really, really quite bizarre. Um, 
<laughs> so I wanted to, I was I was I was wondering what you've been doing with yourself since the pandemic started because I I I know that you guys the band had probably a, a big tour world tour lineup and everything that had to be postponed and stuff. What what kind of stuff have you been doing to stay busy uh, during this weird uh, part of time of, of history? Well, it, it actually seems like I was busier than ever uh, when everything stopped uh, mid-March and we were forced to uh, confine and uh, we started to look into projects that we had uh, put on hold and um, now we're catching up. Uh, we spent the summer catching up with a bunch of stuff, uh, which is uh, uh, first uh, we are writing a new album, uh, but we are... Uh, uh, sort of uh, doing it while socially distancing. <laughs> so yeah. we share, yeah. So we share a Dropbox folder, and uh, we synced on Logic Pro, and we uh, we're trying to move forward with a uh, with a, a studio album. We also had a bunch of live recordings from uh, last year when we uh, we played a, a few uh, we played a few festivals in uh, Quebec, uh, the Jazz Festival in Montreal, which we recorded and filmed. And uh, also the Summer Fest in Quebec City, which we uh, also recorded and filmed. We, uh, so in July, we released an EP with some material from the, the jazz festivals with the brass quintet. And uh, we also released a video uh, with that uh, for the song, The End of Dormancy. And uh, so and now we're focusing on a, a full on LP uh, recorded at the Summer Fest in Quebec City. So uh, we, we uh, just wrapped it up um, and uh, I did the art and everything, the layout, and we, uh, we uh, mastered the whole thing. And, uh, so uh, hopefully it's going to come out before the holidays. That's the main goal. So this right. year, this year, uh, we, um, we also have tried out an uh, uh, online streaming, sh a streaming show that went over super well. And uh, yeah. so, so we're gonna, we might do more of that. We, we're starting over, uh, we're starting playing live again um, in uh, uh, mid-October, uh, but it's a new, um, a new setting. Uh, it's like now they have sanitary uh, protocols uh, in clubs. So we're gonna play a big club, but with only 250 uh, people. And uh, uh, so we'll see. And uh, so we're gonna start playing again only in October. Uh, but this summer we uh, caught up also with a book in the works uh, and also a movie, uh, 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 a Voivod movie as well. Yeah, can, can you talk a little bit about that movie? Because I, I think I asked you earlier that I, I think it was started by one person, but another person might be finishing it. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah it was started by um, Sam Dang, um, and, uh, but he uh, got super busy. And uh, so uh, now we are finishing the movie with Felipe, who did the Deaf documentary uh, about the band Deaf. And so um, hopefully we can uh, wrap up the, the whole editing process uh, this year, but I really doubt it's going to come out this year. It's a long is, process. Is, is it being, is it, is all the pieces of it, have they've already been filmed and now it's just a matter of creating like, some way of putting it together in a cohesive yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. But, and it's like, I guess, you guys telling stories about the history of your band and that kind of thing? There, there are a lot of interviews, um, yeah. but also uh, we put all the archives uh, onto one uh, hard drive. So this alone was a lot of work uh, because over the years there's been tons of different format from tape to digital to zip disks to, and uh, so, um, now we're trying to edit the whole thing into a cohesive uh, movie, but there are still some uh, interviews to be done uh, with uh, Snake and I. Uh, uh, Chewies was uh, interviewed already when we toured with Revocation uh, across North America uh, uh, last fall, fall of last, yeah. last year, yeah. But uh, um, so everything is pretty much there except for an interview with uh, Snake, uh, Rocky and I. And, uh, but we, we have Jason Eusted uh, on it and uh, um, Dave Grohl and uh, plenty of people who's, who's been promoting, uh, who's been uh, promoting Voivod over the years uh, uh, will be featured uh, in, uh, in the movie. 
Awesome. Well, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. And uh, I think you also said that, like, with the, the weirdness of the pandemic, you've also had a chance to sort of, like, maybe push your artwork a little bit more. Um, yes. I think something about reinventing yourself, which is what this year has been all about anyway, just reinventing yeah. what you can do. And you've always had this career as a... Uh, as an illustrator and artist, and people obviously know your stuff, so you're um, planning on doing some stuff with uh, getting your profile, you know, in some. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. When the uh, when the um, I mean the last show I played was in uh, mid March, and um, then I had no idea when I would be able to play again uh, to play live, and so I thought this is the time. Uh, to scan all of my art, uh, finish up a comic book I had started, and uh, and start a, a, a small company called uh, Away Art Press and an online store. And uh, so and and, and so start, uh, it's time for me to start releasing, uh, make more of my art available because uh, I only have one book, Words Away, and uh, yeah. it's uh, it's been more than ten years. So. Uh, Has it been that? Yes. That's a yeah. great book. Thank you. So I want to release more of that. Uh, it's just that for the wake, uh, we toured for a couple of years nonstop. And uh, so not much time for me to be at home scanning material. But uh, I spent the whole summer putting books together, uh, a, a different series of books. Uh, one about my art on the road, one about my art at home, one about my art I do for uh, other people, other bands. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so there, uh, but the first, uh, my first goal was to finish up a comic book I had started and, and uh, it's now printed and uh, uh, it's gonna be available in September. Uh, it's called Tales from the Net. And uh, it's really like, actually, it's something I started when I was, uh, really young in terms of collecting strange stories. Uh, uh, it, I started, I, I already started with uh, when uh, we were using a uh, bolt and board system uh, way back. And then, okay. but uh, over, over the years, uh, I, I gathered a lot of stories that I'm connecting together and uh, uh, illustrating. And it's, it's, I'm just having fun with, uh, 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 mixing up um, time travel, flying saucers, Bigfoot. So it's just great stuff to uh, to draw for me. And that's so the so the first uh, volume one is uh, is uh, uh, coming out in September. And uh, awesome. I'm go yeah, so I'm, go I'm concentrate uh, on uh, uh, doing more books uh, in the future uh, in case. Uh, uh, in case we have to be home uh, for a year, who knows? Uh, although we are starting to play again in mid-October, mid uh, uh, everything we have planned this year, uh, Australia, New Zealand, America, Europe, uh, Japan, everything has been postponed to next year, <laughs> which is very strange. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's totally strange. Um, well, it sounds like you're doing pretty good. Like uh, right away after the started, I, I, I started to read that, oh, they're gonna have an EP come out. So it's like, okay, well, these guys obviously, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna do some stuff and put out some stuff. Uh, so they're just not sitting around, obviously. So, uh, you know, that's, that, that's pretty cool, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's cool. Uh, how are people reacting uh, uh, to the uh, pandemic situation as an observer when you, uh, well, I don't know how often you get out uh, in Montreal, but what are people, how are people reacting to that kind of stuff when you go out and get groceries or whatever? Do you oh, notice that? Uh, well, it uh, it's, seems to be slowly becoming normal to have to go to the gro grocery store with a mask on, but yes. um, um, at first, the, the lineups were really uh, a deterrent uh, to me because they were letting people in uh, just a few at a time. And so the queues were really long. Yeah. But now, now it's starting to be more normal. And um, uh, um, actually, the, um, the number of uh, people uh, getting infect infected is going down in Quebec, uh, which is a good sign. So. Um, 
but uh, we uh, we have uh, uh, still we have a protocol to try to avoid a second wave. So uh, uh, people seems to uh, people seem to understand that uh, um, we need to be uh, careful and not to uh, be too excited to uh, go to parties and all that. So it's just a <laughs> it's. It, are you a big party? Are you a big party guy anyway, though? Me, you don't strike man, me as, you don't strike me as being a big a big social party guy. I, I could been... be, but I, I am <laughs> right. feeling you're probably more on the stay at home introverted side. I've been so, confined. I've been confined for many years, so I'm. <laughs> <laughs> you're used to it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I uh, I've been pretty lucky uh, in my life to spend half of my year on the road or recording with Voivod and the other half at home doing art. So now I'm just spending a little more time doing art at home. Uh, and uh, so um, I'm, I'm a happy fellow, to be honest. It's just that uh, financially, I really had to uh, figure how to uh, prepare, um, uh, prepare my future uh, uh, in case uh, there is a second or third wave or who knows you know and uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah so um i'm trying to uh i'm trying to uh, i want to play music forever uh, but it could happen that we're going to be writing albums uh, more than touring in the next few years we, we don't know but hopefully uh things are going to go back to normal and we will uh, do the world tour uh, next year um so yeah. We, we, we're still getting offers to play everywhere on earth and we just say yeah. yes, we just say yes in case. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, yeah, you seem like you have it all figured out. Hopefully, and... Uh, um, That's, it, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, music career aside, I've been very lucky since this all started because I thought for sure I'd be a goner, which is what I've been saying, but it's like, it seems like people want stuff more often now because they're at home maybe in front of their computers and have, well, I have a little bit of money to, to waste. Yeah. Maybe this guy can draw this, this idea. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I actually feel pretty fortunate. Yes, uh, it's, um, it, you're right. I mean, uh, uh, I, um, I get a lot of uh, um, uh, people really want me to do ink uh, art uh, for them these days. So uh, many people are getting in touch with me uh, to uh, so to commission some uh, black ink on a white paper, and uh, I think I'm going to be doing a lot of that because it seems like people are shopping online a lot more, and uh, so um, the uh, that's why I was saying uh, in, uh, that um, I, I seem to have been busier during the pandi pandemic uh, situation than ever, uh, yeah. which is great, but it it, it um, it's still uh, it, it's still um, um, a sad situation that. Uh, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. yeah. So um, I wish everything was normal, but uh, I must sure. say that I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a better situation than a lot of people I know. Yeah, that's, that's. I kind of, I feel that way for myself, you know, a little bit, you know, and uh, I feel bad, of course, for everybody that's, you know, obviously affected by this. But I'm also kind of grateful that, uh, you know. It, it could have been a lot worse and things um at least personally have gone reasonably pretty well all things considered you know yeah it's uh it's a very um it's really strange uh, to it it's hard to know how how to react to the whole thing with the with all the uh, the different information we get from every side and yeah. i, I I personally you have to, to you have to unplug after a while because yeah. it's like it's not making me happy it's not making me happy to know everything the second a, the second after it happens or to get all this information and you just have to like you know. yes and i i uh, i ended up thinking that i was i'm just gonna i won't take any chance and i don't want to get that virus and i uh, so i uh, either um, stay at home, or if I go to uh, to do some errands, I will wear a mask. And uh, other, and uh, if I want to get some fresh air, I'm gonna ride a bicycle. And so I'm trying to cope with the situation without um, trying to uh, 
uh, obsess over the all the details, uh, info and disinfo that's circulating. <laughs> Man, you have no, no, you, I was going to say you have no idea, but yeah, of course you have an idea. It's like uh, <laughs> when it was all unfolding, it was like, at first it was like, oh, this is an issue of science. So everybody's just going to do the right thing because it's an issue of science and not politics. And, you know, in the United States of America, there's just so many people here. It's so, not as big as Canada, but there's more people here. And there's watching everything happen and everybody fighting and turning it into this yeah. political thing. It's kind of like, oh man, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, like, it, it's just like. I, I was not I, expecting, uh, I was not expecting uh, this to divide the people that much. Uh, yeah, people are really divided now. Well, they want to be divided. That's the thing. That's just crazy. You know, they want to, they want attention, you know. I, to me, it was obvious what to do, but you know, uh, and then I, I drew a bunch of stuff about it and it was fun. But then I just reached this point where it's like, I, I just can't draw these things anymore. You know, it's like, it's really, <laughs> it's not going to influence anybody. Uh, the other thing I'm taking away from all this is that you just can't control what other people do. All you can do is change yourself. That's yeah. really, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people, how they're like learning how to meditate and just, you know, you, Everyone's already yelled at the people that you can yell out, and now it's like, well, it still doesn't matter. You have to just deal with yourself. So that's, you know, I had to stop doing that because, yeah, I, I was kind of surprised too how many people were just like, you know, it just seems so clear. I don't want to get sick, you know. It's like a game of Russian roulette. I just, I'm not prepared mm -hmm. to play. You know, that's yeah. That's, it's uh, everybody is free, so. I uh, uh, I uh, decided not to uh, participate in the debate online, and uh, and I do my own stuff at home, and then I'm uh, then I'm a friend to everybody. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be you gotta be really careful these days. Like just oh, yeah. your own thing, and it's like whoa. Well, I'm gonna ask you a few more questions, and I'll let you go. This actually the second half of this. This is. Much better. Yeah, it's uh, it doesn't it's not breaking up, so that's good. <laughs> and it's also more cohesive. So I, I want, if you don't mind, I want to talk a little bit of just go through your catalog and just a few thoughts for each record because I bought them all, and I'm just curious uh, about what your take is, and I'll make it real brief so it won't be really ridiculous. Okay, if that's okay <laughs> with you. Okay, well the first record I bought that when it came out. And I remember that you guys were on a Metal Massacre record before that, that Brian Slagle yeah. uh, found. Um, that record came out in 1984, I believe, right? Yes. Maybe in the middle of 84 or toward the end? Probably. Uh, that's a good question, but I would say in the summer of 84, maybe. Okay. And you guys got a pretty immediate reaction right off yeah. the bat because of the yeah. cover and just the how it sounded. And, well, um, even though we had influences from uh, very diverse uh, scenes, uh, from prog rock to punk rock uh, to crop rock to uh, metal, um, we were uh, immediately uh, associated with the trash uh, metal movement, which was uh, exploding at that time. Uh, oh, yeah. With, uh, yeah, and so uh, we really benefited from that. But of course, being on the Metal Blade uh, compilation, uh, Metal Massacre, really helped because everybody was on uh, on this uh, compilation. So we were lucky to to be there at the right time when everything exploded. It was really exciting, actually. To sure. uh, yeah, yeah it was great. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so uh, all of a sudden we're part of a scene with uh, 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 like uh, Anthrax, Megadeth, Metallica, Exodus, Testament, but also. Uh, destruction, creator, uh, Celtic Frost, but also discharge, oh, broken bones, the broken bones, and uh, re you know all all these bands. Oh yeah, all the punk, all yeah. the punk rock kids I knew that were open-minded loved the first Boy Bob record. You know, so you know it was the, it was really half punk, half metal. So uh, it, it, we didn't have any picture on the album, and uh, the first couple of shows we played, uh, some people with Mohawk. Uh, will show up and they were, they were like we thought you guys were punkers but we were totally like half punk and half metal <laughs> I would say so I, I would agree um, now Roar that 
that came out at a different label. And uh, I, you know, to this day, that's the record. And that has the incredible cover. But that's the record I'm just the least familiar with out of all your records. I don't know why, but that's, I don't know why. Um, I think it was re recorded with a sound man you have. Time, what are your yeah. thoughts on horror looking back? Well, we had just moved to Montreal and we were really, really poor. Um, and uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we didn't have much money to, uh, uh, to record an album. Uh, we recorded it with uh, Mike Amstadt, uh, our live soundman, which is still our live soundman today. Really? <laughs> and, uh, yes. And uh, you might have met him a couple of times. And um, so um, we did it in a, a, a studio which was built in an old school. And so um, it was really lo-fi. And um, we uh, halfway through the, uh, the recording, we got uh, some of our gear stolen uh, in Montreal. And uh, uh, so we, we were struggling to finish it up. And uh, uh, we ended up uh, booking a festival called the World War Three in Montreal uh, with yeah. Nasty. Yeah, so uh, we we, uh, we, had Nasty, we we had Nasty Savage, uh, Destruction, Possess, and Celtic Frost playing with us, and I remember uh, and, uh, Nasty Savage. And, and, yeah, Nasty Savage. and a few a few thousand a uh, few thousand of people showed up, so we were able to finish the album. There is a lot of anger and um, on this album and. Um, it's like, I would say it's like Angerat in the sense that many people didn't get into it. Uh, many people like it now, but uh, so, um, yeah, it's not an album that had uh, the strongest impact, but it allowed us to start touring around the world. Uh, first with Celtic Frost across uh, USA and then Possess across Europe. What happened was at the World War III, we gave a... Um, uh, a demo tape of war, uh, it was half finished at this point, to Martin Ain from Celtic Frost. He brought it back to Europe and gave it to Noise Records and all of a sudden we have a deal for three albums. So even though the, the, even though the album was not like uh, what we really wanted, uh, uh, it allowed us to do a world tour. And uh, yeah, yeah. so, yeah. And it's like a stepping stone to killing technology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Killing Technology, uh, I'm going to sound like an idiot here, but that's like, that was, I remember hearing that record, um, the guy, this guy I knew, uh, named Steve Shelton, he's this very influential, famous drummer here in North Carolina, he played drums, or still does, in a band called Confessor, I don't know okay. if you've heard of Confessor. I, 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 it rings a bell, actually. Yeah, yeah. but there, it was super... Uh, technical but still with soul really ahead of its time and he's like a pretty amazing drummer but he bought it and i was like oh it must be out and we listened to it and within like the first three minutes when you know the song kicks in it's like man like it just seemed like you guys just took this quantum leap forward and then and i've said this to you before and uh people agree with me now after uh, 20 or 30 years but it's like i was like we both thought I think these guys must like the Croizen a little bit, and I, and not so much maybe musically, although there are obviously similarities. But it's just I think just some of the chords that Piggy used, and how yeah. it was kind of similar to some of the chords that Brian or Herman or whatever the fuck his name is, Brian. That's his Brian. name. Brian. Brian. Brian yeah. Um, but it's not just the Croizen thing. It's just this quantum leap forward and like just songwriting and. You know, had all the old fury, but it's like obviously kind of uh, more progressive, and that's still that record is still, you know, I'll I'll put that record up against any uh, of your peers, I guess. Like you know, I'll, I I still can play that record and Tornado and all those songs and get the same charge that I got when I was a little kid. Cool. And uh, you know, I I listen to that. I've listened to that record way more than Slayer, who I love, and Metallica, who I did, you know, at one time really like and stuff. And um, what was going on during that time, like musically speaking, or in, or well, I'm just trying to say, how did you how did you go from Roar to Killing Technology? What was going on with like what you guys were listening to or whatever? Well, we were um, we were listening to still the old metal and hardcore material but we had been uh, uh, 
getting more into industrial music and what we call alternative music, like Killing Joke. And uh, uh, yeah, so, okay. yeah, yeah. And uh, also, uh, in terms of uh, the concept, a um, lot of things were happening back then, like the, the um, let's say, the, the Chernobyl explosion, the Challenger explosion, uh, the, the, and the uh, uh, Regan Star Wars uh, project. Uh, and um, uh, so um, this really, uh, uh, I don't know, it moved us into uh, this uh, apocalyptic uh, uh, scenario even more. And we, we used it uh, as a lyrical content, but also at, uh, we had been, uh, I would say between 83 and 89, we pretty much rehearsed every night. So, um, by the time we did the uh, Kinney Technology, we were already better than on Roar and so on. And, uh, um, and then we did uh, Dimension Atros and we were, uh, I, I thought we were even better musically, you know? So, yeah. the, 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 but the, the, the strange part of the whole noise um, deal um, was that every time we would, we, we would release an album and then we would do a world tour and the world tour would end um, somewhere in Germany or Europe, and then we would take the train to Berlin and record a new album, which meant that we had to write Killing, Killing Technology before leaving on tour for Raw, and we had to write Dimension Hatreds before leaving on tour for Killing Technology. So I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed that we were able to release an album a year and a world tour a year and, and be that intricate musically. But it's, it's crazy. But we lived together and we worked on Voivod together and we were moving forward uh, at, at a super accelerate, accelerated pace. And um, uh, uh, when I heard um, the BMG um, ratio of uh, the, 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 the three albums on noise um, a couple of years ago, and, and they, all, um, they, they also released um, sort of a condensed version of the three albums on a, a, a double CD and it, it's in chronological order so between the first song of War and the last song of Dimension Hatras it's only a couple of years and it's on it's almost like it's not the same band I was uh, yeah. I didn't realize that before I heard the the best of the noise years a couple of years ago and uh, but it's we were just like leaving the Voiva thing and we were super serious about uh, trying to make it which is not obvious if you are a French Canadian uh, from northern Quebec you know it's uh, at first I I really didn't think uh, we could have a career at all uh, and uh, I actually waited until War and Pain came out before leaving university so but by the time we, then we decided to move to Montreal in 85 and try to make it. And uh, uh, it just uh, uh, went from step up to step up to step up, you know, and, uh, uh, yeah. and uh, within a few years. So yeah. exciting. I, I, that's, it's crazy because like, um, I know a lot of fans of Boy Vibe considered, uh, there was like a holy trinity, I guess, so to speak. The Holy Trinity starts with killing technology and then dimension and then nothing face. And like you just said, all that stuff was put together in like a really fucking short amount of time. When you, I mean, that's crazy because like that stuff, even when nothing face came out, I mean, I'm not trying to pass dimension because that's like obviously a step up too. And, you know, but when nothing face came out, slightly different production, you know, cleaner, uh, better. Um, it got some attention and uh, the Pink Floyd video uh, cover and video got attention on MTV. I remember that. But when I look back and hear those records, I just think that's really crazy because this is still some really weird out there music. Like totally just, you know, it's, it's, it's very intricate and unique. And the fact that it was actually in this, released in this climate that people seem to really like it is kind of amazing when you look back, you know, because it, it just, it's just, it's so, the music is so bizarre, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not to me, not to me, uh, to me, it, 
you know, I wouldn't use that as, uh, you know, like an insult, but it's just such weird sounding music when the, the interest level rose that high, you know, I, I saw that video more than once, you know, it wasn't just, they played it once and that was it. That video was on some sort of rotation down the States, you know? Um, yeah. It's, it, it, it's well, just, it's, uh, I think a uh, high risk uh, at Music Lab uh, the, uh, who uh, produced uh, Killing Tech and uh, Dimension uh, really helped us to move um, in the right direction in terms of um, 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 putting more layers of music and uh, being, being a little more psychedelic. And uh, uh, so uh, by the time we did the video, uh, Tribal Convictions, uh, for, um, uh, we were, at, that, at that time we were recording in Berlin. Uh, so we did, uh, Killing, we did Killing Tech and uh, uh, Dimension at the Music Lab in Berlin. And Harris was very uh, influential. Um, and uh, um, so by the time we did the video for uh, Tribal Conviction, uh, uh, we were pretty much accepted and uh, um, by the metal scene and and more <laughs> and uh, uh, so the uh, the video attracted the attention of major labels and so um, we were able to jump from uh, noise to MCA uh, for uh, nothing face um, uh, which was again a step up so the whole 80s um, period for Voivod was just like really going uh, going up uh, yeah. and up and up, yeah. And not just metal people like Voivod too, it brought out um, people that liked other kinds of stuff, you know, it wasn't just like, you know, because at yeah. a certain point, I think the music might've been too complex for some people to latch on to if they weren't quite as open-minded, you know? And I, I just remember there were other people that listened to other kinds of music than just you know, uh, speed metal that, that liked it. But um, yeah, I think, uh, even like, uh, I mean, people into Sonic Youth liked it. People into Slint liked it. Uh, people in these bands like Voivod, like Thurston Moore. And uh, so, uh, and, and uh, like you mentioned earlier, um, um, I, I introduced Piggy to um, Dick Croydon, um, and he really, really loved October Fowl and then, uh, and then uh, uh, Century Days. And so, um, and, uh, um, and it's true that um, he was influenced by Brian, and Brian was influenced by Piggy. The, when we, uh, uh, it was when we toured with uh, Celtic Frost that I fi we finally met Dick Royden in Milwaukee, and uh, and uh, Brian uh, was uh, chatting with Piggy about uh, Alex Lifeson from Rush and Robert Fripp, and so and uh, so we uh, we sort of um, uh, reached people into the indie scene as well, which was yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I don't want to skip those two records, but I want to move along because I don't want to take up that much of your time. But uh, let's go to uh, Angel Rat, which I remember um, was a very polarizing record. But I remember the first time I heard it, I was like, uh, uh, this is different, but this is really good. And, you know, not everybody that I knew thought that, but most people kind of did. And then as time went by, people have uh, come around to the record and accepting it as what it was and not a continuation of the last three records. You know, it's a, a so-called normal sounding Voivod is still still pretty pretty much your own thing and it's still kind of weird. It, it's definitely not, it wasn't cookie cutter or anything like that. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Um, and, you get, and that's the one record that you guys didn't tour on, I think, right? We didn't tour on Ninja Rat. Um, you lost, you lost uh, Blackie too. Yeah, we. Uh, um, I mean, it, it, it was a, it was a, a strange uh, period for us where uh, Nothing Face had been very successful and um, sold a lot, and um, uh, the Astronomy uh, Domine video uh, had a lot of airplay, and we were, and uh, so I would say that everybody were expecting Nothing Face Part Two, and it's yes. really so. But we went to different uh, direction. We, uh, in 1990, uh, we did a tour with Soundgarden and Fit No More. I and, saw that. Uh, I saw yeah, you guys. Yep. This tour had the strongest impact on us. And uh, we saw, the, we, we felt the wind was uh, changing direction. The, yeah. And um, uh, we tried to focus on groovy material instead of intricate prog material but we kept the proggy psychedelic vibe 
And, uh, but I uh, would say that when it came out, uh, when Angel Rat came out, uh, all eyes were uh, directed towards Seattle. And uh, so uh, it, did, it really went unnoticed. And we didn't, and Blackie uh, left when we were mixing the album. So we didn't tour that album. Uh, uh, we, uh, we preferred to, uh, to go back to work and write The Auto Limits. And then we went to LA to record it. And, uh, um, and that went really well, actually. Um, this one, we did a major world tour for The Auto Limits, which was, which was amazing. Yeah, well, that's a great, Auto Limits is a great record. And uh, it has um, a couple of my favorite songs, Jack Luminous, of course, being one of them. And, uh, and then Lost Machine, just that, yeah. uh, the ride symbol thing, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> really good. And that drum sound is, um, do you mind just talking a tiny bit about that? Because that's like uniquely the drums that you recorded for Outer Limits. That was like a one-time deal, but the drums sound really cool in a weird way. Can you explain really quickly how that came to be? Because the drums sound really great, but it seems like a one-time only deal. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I don't think I will ever do it again. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I like, it, it really fits the, the overall sound uh, of the album. And the atmosphere. Absolutely. But it's just that I uh, actually, uh, um, I sampled my drum kit, uh, Tama Art Star that I had that I use on Nothing Face. And um, uh, I used the uh, uh, drum pads, even the cymbals uh, were uh, electronic pads. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and everything was put into Cubase uh, uh, on a computer. And uh, sh I showed up in LA with two ADAT tapes and the, guy built, the guys built on that. And uh, so it was cool for that project but I, uh, it was missing the, um, the room uh, mic, you know, that uh, the leak between sure. the, the symbols and it was missing that. It had to be, it, it had to be added electronically, basically, some kind yes. of huge actor button. <laughs> and uh, so I, it was fun, but it's the only time I did that. And I, uh, I uh, much prefer to play on an acoustic uh, kit. Right, right. A lot of people like that record too, uh, especially as time goes on, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. you know. um, all right, I'm going to speed along here. Uh, trio. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I thought you handled that really, really well. I thought Neg I liked Megatron the very first time I heard it, and uh, I liked Eric just fine. I thought he did a good job, sort of mm -hmm. taking over two jobs at once. And uh, yeah, impressive. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and, uh, you know, Insect, uh, Cosmic Conspiracy, um, Meteor, those are all really good songs. And I saw you guys on that tour, um, and I think I read some interviews where um, maybe at the time the band sort of went more underground and also that some people didn't, were kind of uh, negative toward the idea of Voivod going on as a three piece, hence the title Negatron. Is there any truth in that? No, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the title uh, has to do with uh, physics, really. Uh, but um, um, yeah, well, after we, uh, we toured a lot for the Auto Limits uh, in 93 and uh, 94, and we had just finished a tour with the band Fight, Rob Halford's band, Fight. Yeah, and uh, yeah. we, we, we actually, uh, we did a great uh, North American tour and actually ended the tour in Alaska in Anchorage. <laughs> it was really amazing. And, um, but when we got back home, uh, Snake told us he wanted to try something else and, uh, uh, yeah. in life. And um, we had uh, started writing Nano Man and uh, but because Piggy and I wanted to go back to the uh, hardcore side of Voivod, we I, we thought we had explored the psychedelic side a lot with Angel Rat and uh, the uh, the other limits. So, uh, but Snake didn't like the idea of going back to the hardcore roots. Uh, okay. So he decided to leave the band in the spring of '94. Then uh, Eric was recommended by uh, our management, and uh, we auditioned him. him and uh, we, we clicked with him immediately. 
and I started writing Megatron immediately, but the demos we sent to NCA um, didn't please them. It was too heavy. And they said we had no idea how to market that type of uh, hardcore music, even though they were, at this point there was like Panther, Pantera was huge, there were um, Fear Factory and so even, uh, yeah. so, but, but MCA said we, uh, we don't know how to promote this, but you are free to go and shop around, which is great because uh, some friends of mine had troubles with uh, contracts that were shelved and they couldn't use the name of the band anymore or the, the tapes of the album. And, but for us, we were in such good relationship with MCA. They said, you're free to shop around. So we decided to go back the indie way uh, and uh, sign with Hypnotic. And so um, uh, the years with Eric uh, are years that we toured the most. It was just crazy. Uh, even though I feel like the last two or three years I've toured more than ever, but in the mid eight, uh, mid nineties, where I was a lot of touring, we, we would do tours with Crisis and Propane that would last three or four months, and uh, it was really uh, really intense. But um, we, uh, it was a great formation as a trio because we could fit anywhere on a corner of a room or a stage. You know, we uh, didn't take much space. So yeah. we uh, so we were uh, we opened for for tons of friends of uh, of ours like Neurosis and they they brought us on tour a lot and so uh, I um, I see it as a wonderful period uh, but of course the momentum was ruined when we uh, crashed in Germany in '98 when we were heading to Walking and uh, uh, a tower blew up and we rolled five times and uh, uh, Eric was thrown out of the van and it was, it was such a really yeah, so. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, uh, but uh, before that, we, ha we had released Phobos. Yes. And yeah, and uh, which we worked a lot on. Uh, we, we thought we could do like a Dimension Head for us, but 10 years later or something. And uh, so we, we worked like crazy on this one. I love that record. That's like, I think Phobos is like next to Angel Rat is the most singular Voivod release, uh, you know, and it, that's one of my, I mean, not like I'm really into, these are my top records, but I would say Phobos is definitely in my top three uh, of cool. the era because it's mm. it's the scariest sounding record, you guys, ever, it's just this terrifying journey, basically, you know, and, and it's that, really, really dark. It's, it's uh, really it's, dark. Yeah. Like the guitar, Piggy's guitar, there's like almost no solos whatsoever it's just nope. like it's just like a wash of terror but <laughs> played on guitar it's just yeah. like wave after wave of fear like the oxygen's gonna run out in an hour and we're fucked this is it <laughs> and, and i think eric's voice perfectly uh complements the music and i thought yeah. he did you know he he really put it across and uh I've turned a lot of people on to Phobos that were like, oh, I don't know. And it's like, no, man, Phobos is really, really good. Um, so I guess it's not surprising that you spent a lot of time on it. But it's definitely, yeah. to me, it's the most singular record. And it's the most frightening record as far as like, well, if you want to hear a record that's going to scare you, this is the record to put on. It's almost like the Scott Walker tilt uh, of uh, the Voivod catalog. It's just yeah. it's a really it's great. A, yeah, it was a... Uh... We, we made it really atmospheric and uh, dystopian and um, uh, that, that was intended um, uh, and I, it kept the album from selling a lot but uh, it's still very respected and then we had a bunch of leftovers from uh, Nicketron and Phobos plus live material recorded around the planet and we compiled everything into a chronic and it, it's while uh, touring chronic that we uh, crashed. Then we were put on hold uh, for a year, uh, waiting for Eric uh, to come out of the hospital and recover, and so uh, it's uh, during that year, um, uh, uh, end of '98 and most of '99, that I started to make myself more available as a graphic artist. Right. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, yeah. And then, and then Eric came back. We did a tour with Iron Maiden, and then we did a tour with Dio, and it was super amazing. And then we uh, wrote an album while Eric was uh, recovering, and then yeah. we were gonna we were gonna record it in the in 2000, 
um, um, or 2001 ish um, with Steve Albini. And, uh, but by the uh, end of 2000, Piggy and I had, uh, we had lost the motivation to, and decided to split the band. Um, but it was not long before we got NC and uh, we formed with uh, Snake and uh, Jason Houston. Right, which led to the, uh, a boost of uh, more of a higher profile and, and uh, he, um, yeah. he did the self-titled album through his record label. Yeah. We did a self-titled album and it brought us a lot of attention and we were sort of going back to the limelight we had for Nothing Face. And uh, yeah. we also, um, at this point, uh, we did a tour uh, with Sepultura across USA was really amazing in 2003 and then Jason was asked to play for Ozzy mm -hmm. and then uh, and then he was also asked to get Voivod as an opener for Ozzy <laughs> so we uh, we spent months touring the um, across North America for the Ozfest and then across Canada opening for Ozzy and and Jason, and Jason was playing two shows a day for like months in a row. Uh, I was really exhausted by the uh, end of the summer. And um, we were uh, also asked to go to uh, op uh, and uh, open for Ozzy in Europe. And um, uh, Ozzy broke his foot or something and everything was canceled. And uh, uh, so uh, we decided to uh, write a double album. Um, and then uh, in early 2005, um, PE was taken ill and uh, um, uh, um, was uh, diagnosed with cancer, colon cancer, and uh, unfortunately passed um, in August um, uh, of 2005. So, yeah. the, so the two albums we had, the double album we had started uh, with Piggy uh, ended up being two albums. Uh, uh, 14 and Infini. The ones that came afterwards when you regrouped to finish the, the idea of, of the double record, but it was two separate records. Yes, uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we ended up um, deciding to release the double album separately. And uh, um, it was hard enough to uh, finish uh, 14 in 2006. Uh, was not uh, so it took a couple of years before us before we were able to go into a studio to finish Anthony. It was very demanding for everybody to uh, be in a studio without Piggy and have Piggy in the headphones only. Uh, when uh, for years and years and decades uh, uh, we had been uh, we had eye contact in the studio uh, with Piggy, so uh, these were uh, really tough years. We we. Uh, actually uh, spent um, three years finishing up uh, these uh, albums or three or four years. And yeah. uh, um, it's only in 2008, uh, we were asked to uh, reform for the heavy Montreal festival uh, uh, here in Montreal. And um, um, so we uh, reformed with uh, Chewy, uh, and uh, Blackie, and uh, started uh, and uh, started playing uh, a lot of shows, festivals. It was supposed to be a one-off thing, and then the word Kept. spread. Yeah, and uh, it was supposed to be the festival in Montreal in the summer of 2008. But the word spread that we were back together. The reaction was amazing at the at the show because many kids they never thought they would see Voivod. So and there yeah. we were. So, so, uh, and at first we were really afraid that it could be sacrilege to people to play without uh, uh, Piggy, but they were just happy to see Voivod and it was very uh, reassuring. And then uh, uh, all of a sudden we are asked to play the Monsters of Rock in the Calgary with Judas Priest and Ozzy. And then, uh, we, then we got invited by Testament to play in Japan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, so it just kept going and kept going. And uh, we, we are still touring today, so. Yeah, I remember uh, um, you guys, well, I think I had contacted you. You guys had played uh, a show opening for Creator, Creator, 
uh, in Springfield, Virginia, and I yes. you were nice enough to get me and my friend in. And I just remember there was a lot of joy on stage because you guys clearly found the right guy. Uh, oh, yeah. Dan, obviously. Yeah. But the other, but all four of you seemed very, it was like this triumphant moment. Like, um, I can imagine because of experiencing that loss and just to actually be able to come back in a way yeah. that, um, made sense and was it was just you guys all seemed very joyous and happy to be up there playing that music that's what i remembered yeah. about just how happy we you guys we seemed were, to be there was no angry faces it was like everybody seemed really happy to yeah. be doing it yeah definitely we were um, we were happy to be back at it we were always a happy band on stage but uh, we were also super happy to be on the road with creator um, which we had toured worldwide in '87, uh, uh, so uh, with you know, so uh, it was fun to uh, get back on the road with these guys, which were super old friends, and uh, yeah. and that that's a cool thing. People, um, other bands were happy that we were back together, so they could bring us on the road, which was uh, great. And uh, so um, uh, and it's um, it's still uh, mind blowing to me because. Um, we still play festivals and uh, uh, with uh, people we were playing with in the mid eighties, and yeah. uh, and we we uh, we chat and uh, we wonder why we are still relevant. Uh, I think it's because of what we talked about earlier. Uh, uh, the trash metal movement was like the hardcore movement was based around the destruction of this planet, the fear of the destruction of Earth. And, yeah. it's, uh, and it's still relevant. And I think that's why many, many kids are uh, into trash metal these days. And, uh, and they, they are like tons of kids into trash metal. It's bigger than ever. So uh, yeah. Yeah, which is great. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And also the music's good. So that's the thing, the music's. Um, since uh, Target Earth came out, really good. Uh, um, it was too bad that Blackie bowed out. That's, uh, but, but, yeah. you know, um, it's, uh, people it's really, were happy. It's people really, were happy to yeah. come back. You know, I was like, man, there he is. You know, he's yeah. because he was such an intricate part of all the your your early work, and he had that incredible bass sound. But it's like, oh well. Um, but you still you found a very capable placement in rocky he's yeah. really good we we tried to um we made it last for six years um and uh we were really uh, happy with target earth people were happy about it uh we had a, a been signed with, with a, to a very established label century media and yeah. uh so and uh, um unfortunately uh, in the uh, it's it, it's uh the the summer of uh, uh, 2014, <clears throat> where uh, Blackie left the band for the second time, and uh, uh, and Rocky is a childhood friend of uh, Chewy, and uh, we were really wondering what to do. And Chewy said, "I know somebody. I'm sure, 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 sure he can do it." And we're yeah. like, right, and we auditioned Rocky, and it was like um, the the chemistry was there immediately, and uh, yeah. now. Now we have a lineup that's on fire. Uh, it's just, uh, it's the best ca uh, camaraderie, the best chemistry, uh, the, it's just really functional. And yeah, um, yeah. and it's also very versed into um, um, the ter um, ter te oh, that's a tough English word, ter <laughs> The theor uh, theoretical side of uh, the music, like the theory, like the tyranny, tyrannical. Um, yeah, like he knows. I, how I can barely. I, well, hey, I can barely speak English sometimes, and, I, <laughs> and that's the only language I know. Like, so. what, what I mean is, um, uh, Chewy and Rocky, uh, they they uh, know how to write and read music perfectly well, and, uh, oh. and they, they, so it's very um, efficient for them to write music and uh, uh, Snake and I just look at them with a puzzled face and uh, okay, 
uh, and then we uh, uh, we're more like the old punks, you know, uh, uh, in the in the recipe. And but uh, it's just now we with Rocky and Chewy, we jumped into this fusion metal thing, where uh, and it's very challenging, which yeah. is great. It's really great. And uh, so yeah. we uh, so we went back with their knowledge of music. We sort of went back to the proggy style of Voivod. And, uh, and when we released The Wake, everybody went nuts. Uh, oh, yeah. We, the wake. The we, were not, yeah, we were not expecting that reaction. We actually started a tour uh, when uh, The Wake came out um, uh, at the end of uh, 2018. Uh, we started a tour in Europe. And uh, the album came out. Uh, we had played three or four shows. And then the album came out. And immediately, the clubs got really packed. And uh, the album had a huge buzz. And by uh, early uh, 2019, we had won a Juno. And then we did these crazy tours with Yard, and then uh, uh, and ended up touring uh, with Revocation and then War and, uh, and playing tons of, tons of festivals. We just toured nonstop for two years, uh, which allowed us to uh, redirect our activities without too much worries when the pandemic uh, hit uh, in March, uh, we had gathered enough uh, financial security to say, okay, we can tour, but we can do this and this and this and this, uh, right. which, is, which is a blessing. Yeah. yeah. Well, that time, the time you guys came through with Yacht, that was like, if not the best Voivod show, even with Piggy, that was probably my favorite show that I saw. You know, that was, it was really good, you know, and that was, that was a year ago? That was, ago? Uh, it was uh, the spring of 2019. So uh, uh, it was uh, just an amazing tour. We loved these guys. We shared the bus with them and got along really well. Uh, yeah, they seemed like a, nice people. It was a very successful tour. Yeah. So like, you're like in this weird position where how many years now has, it's, is it 40 years now? I don't even know. Uh, it's 37 years. Okay, uh, but I'm, but the idea, been, uh, but the idea of you guys still being a band and coming back from losing a very important person and then s somehow finding somebody—he's like uh, Dan's, like what, ten years younger, I guess, the generation before. And yeah. Rocky, I guess, is the same. So to find two guys <laughs> to step in. And then put out this record that's completely on top of your game 30 years into your career i don't i can't think of a lot of people that have done that to be honest so that's oh, do you like just go man that's crazy that we were able, able to well, do this it's uh, it's uh, it's encouraging uh i mean it's a good indication that we are heading the right path but this being said being voivod the material we are writing now doesn't necessarily sound like the wake. Uh, so we'll see what, is gonna, what uh, in the end, what's going to happen. But uh, like back when we did Nothing Face, uh, people might be expecting the wake part two, but it might not be that. But that's Voivod. It yeah, has yeah. to yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys have managed to create this thing that's uniquely your own thing uh, that started, obviously, with the original four piece. And um, you've continued doing this thing that's uniquely yours with a few other people that know about, you know, uh, what the old sound consisted of. You know, you've created something that's unique to um, uh, the four of you, and that's something, you have your own sound, and that's something a lot of people, as you know, I can think of some people, some bands, uh, you know, the Melvins, uh, the Descendants, all people, regardless of whether people like that stuff or not, it's very uniquely something that the two or three or four of them have created. It's like this this thing. And yeah. there's a lot of people that sound like Slayer. There's a lot of people that sound like Slint or Sonic Youth or this or that, and you guys just always sound like you guys, no matter what it sounds like. If that makes yeah. sense. We, 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 um, we try to keep the signature intact, but it's not really done 
consciously. Um, yeah. I think it's just everybody have his own signature and everything combined morphs into Voivod. But we, we uh, I mean, um, uh, Chewie will write the bulk of the music, but when we rehearse it, uh, and then I get involved, and then Snake's get, uh, Snake gets involved, and then, uh, and Rocky, and it just morphs into Voivod material automatically. And uh, uh, it's just that um, we uh, we try to explore different territory uh, as much as we can. Uh, it has played against us at times, but on the long sure. run, uh, on the long run, we have a lot of respect because of it uh, from the critics, the public, the labels. So it paid off in the end. But at times we had a very low profile because we were really, really out of sync with with uh, what uh, what was happening in the mainstream. So uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I just want to thank you for answering questions about every album that you uh, you've done. <laughs> Spending an hour talking about it, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, You're welcome. All I can say is thanks.